we're continuing today in our series on identity. And so all the administrators and educators and parents who are here on today, in essence, what you're trying to do is shape the identity of your children. Amen? And so when you go and drop them off at school, they're there to help shape the identity of your kids. The challenge is, is that very often when it comes to identity, our society wants to shape identity by external factors rather than by internal character and virtue. Amen? And so what we want to do is, as believers, we want to make sure that for believers in Jesus Christ, you have a clear Christian identity. The challenge is, is that very often we have the label Christian and that we are legitimately Christian, but we don't really know what the content of that Christianity is. Amen? I worked hard this week. I work hard every week to keep stuff simple and plain. My philosophy as an educator is that um, our job is to make things clear and simple. And so every week I, I, I endeavor to make things clear and simple, not simplistic, but I, I, I don't think it takes a, a wise person to keep the complicated things complicated. I think uh, the sign of a great teacher, a great educator, is someone who can take difficult concepts and make them so clear a baby can understand. And so from week to week, you all would agree what I present is simple. <laughs> right? You're like, it's oversimplistic, Pastor. Today, it's going to be a little different. Today, I, 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 I'm trying my best to simplify things, make it really, really simple. But the reality is, is that there's only, there's only so much you can do to make things simple that are substantive and concrete. Amen? So I want to stretch us today in our faith because this area of identity, I think, is one of the most important areas of the Christian faith. See, we got a lot of people who say, you know what, I'm Christian, I, I, I got the t-shirt, I got a cross around my neck. But when it comes to how they parent, what kind of spouse they are, how they work, how they live, how they make an impact, what their passions and aspirations are, then they're really not Christian at that level. And so I want to see us be Christian through and through. Amen? I want you all to turn to Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, there's one power-packed passage that I think um, is significant for our Christian life. This passage is a very well-known passage. Any of you all who do scripture memory have probably memorized this scripture, but very often we may memorize it but don't internalize it. I want to um, methodically work through, this, um, work through this particular passage. I only got through probably about 10% of my sermon this morning, so next week's sermon is already written. <laughs> But this week, this pastor says in verse 20, it's on page 9. That's fine. Right, I'm not there yet. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. It's on page 973. It says, for, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I believe in all the Bible. I believe in all the passages in the Bible. I think this is one of the most critical biblical passages in the entire Bible. I think if we understand and undertake this biblical passage, it'll transform our Christian experience. I think this passage underscores what it means when it says the just shall live by faith. If you read Paul, we call him Pauline or, or Pauline doctrines. The, cruc the, the crucible and the crux of Pauline faith is justification by faith. In other words, we are justified by faith in juxtaposition to being justified by the law. 
In chapters 1 and 2, Paul is basically trying to declare the gospel in the book of Galatians. Chapters 3 and 4, he's basically trying to explain the gospel. Chapters 5 and 6, he's basically trying to apply the gospel. If you want to memorize it, the DEA. Smile at me. That don't cause you to get nervous. What Paul is trying to do is say, you know what? When it comes to the law, to Jewish people who came out of the law, people who tried to work their way to heaven, people who try to do enough good deeds to get to heaven, what Paul is trying to argue is that you cannot do enough good to earn your way to heaven. You cannot put together enough good works to merit going to heaven. In other words, when you commit one sin, you disqualify yourself from being able to go to heaven. In chapter 2, starting at verse 15, what Paul does is he begins to argue the inadequacy of the law to bring a person to salvation. Then in verse 20, what he does is he takes himself as an example of, the, of, of, of a prototypical Christian and what he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. If you've read Philippians chapter 3, where Paul gives his resume, you'll see that as it pertains to the law and Judaism, there wasn't probably anybody else who was more astute at the law, more, more accustomed to the law. There was nobody else who was as zealous for their faith as Paul was pertaining to the law. So much so that Paul used to go and kill other Christians because, because he didn't believe in the law and what the, I'm sorry, he didn't believe in Christianity and what Christianity taught. And so now Paul is trying to argue here that you really have to die to live. Now I want to entitle my sermon today, Dying to Live. The Bible says to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world than to lose his soul? What Paul argues here is that you've got to die if you want to really live. The challenge for us is that we're so busy living that we haven't died to the flesh. And so, but we're trying to put together a magnificent life. We're trying to put together a phenomenal, we're trying to put together a God life. And God says, you know what? You cannot manufacture and you cannot fabricate the kind of life I want to give you. And so what happens is Christians end up frustrated, Christians end up angry, Christians end up defeated, Christians end up back out the Christian faith because the Christian faith is not satisfying because based upon their schematic, based upon their strategy, they have not been able to successfully live a life that brings the results and, 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 the, and, the, and the product that they're working for. Galatians 2 and 20 says that basically you haven't been successful there because you are not dying to live. Here's my thesis. You can only express Christ fully when you experience him faithfully. You can only express Christ fully when you experience him faithfully. In other words, what's happened is many of us are living our own version of the Christian life but we're not really living the Christian life that God is talking about. Amen? So what I want to do, I want to, I want to kind of break down this biblical passage, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, to help rivet into our minds what it really means to be united to Christ, what it really means to be identified with Christ, what it really means to die to live. Amen? To do so, I have um, done what I normally don't show you guys. So normally, um, I leave a whole bunch of stuff in my study that I don't share out here with you all. Amen? But what, what I normally do, is, especially in the New Testament, I start from the original language and then work from the original language and try to figure out what was he saying to that original audience and then going from that original audience about what is the timeless principle for all audiences. And then I try to craft it and put it together to make it palatable for this audience. Amen? And so normally I leave a lot of stuff on the table. Today I want to expose you all to my study. Is that cool? Because I think it's so important for you all to understand the dynamics of what's transpiring in this biblical passage. If y'all put the, the um, first passage up there. Um, there. So when you come to this passage, um, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. There are some things transpiring in the Greek that you cannot see in the English. 
So when he comes here, that word, I have been crucified with Christ, this word here, um, sunestaromai, what that's saying is that's the part about um, being crucified together. The um, S-U-N right here is, is together. That word right here is a compound word. That's the word crucified. We, um, I have been crucified together with Christ. If you notice that Christ, crystal, comes at the front of the statement. So in the original, what the writer wants you to see is that the emphasis is not on you. The emphasis is not for a narcissistic person, but the emphasis is on Christ and what Christ has done. But many of us in trying to live the Christian life, we don't put Christ at the front of the sentence. We put ourselves there. And so what happens, we, we end up being dissatisfied. We end up being out of place because we put ourselves in a place where Christ does not put us. In the second line, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and boy, he's trying to emphasize how you're living. That term there, zoo, and, and boy, this word zay, are talking about living. He says, it's no longer I who lives. In other words, how are you living, 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 living? No longer I. Look where I, that's ego, that, that's where I is. Look where I is. I doesn't come first, I comes last. But the problem with our Christian lives is that we put I first. My house, my car my kids, my mate, my bank account. And then we wonder why we cannot live the Christ life effectively. You know what? Living as long as I who lives, that word dead, that, that means but. It's called a light adversity. But, 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 but I'm, I'm living the life I now live. I live in Christ. Um, um, I'm in my Christ, living my life in Christ. And so now, how are you living? Are you living your life that, boy, Christ is now living on the inside of you? So the Christian life is impossible to manufacture. The Christian life is impossible to fabricate. It's no longer what you are doing, but now it's Christ living on the inside of you. Amen? And so now, are you allowing Christ to live in you? Go to the next one, please. It's, it's not no longer you allowing Christ to live um, um, as a part of your life, but Christ wants to be the engine. Christ wants to be the focal point. Christ wants to live his life through you because you cannot live the Christ life in the power of the flesh. We're still together. So up here up top, um, um, high day noon, it says now, 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 now. He's, and boy, living in the flesh, um, sarki, here, this word right here, sarki, that means living in flesh. Um, he says, um, I am living by faith in the Son of God. And boy, this is the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. Are we tracking together? And so Christ, you know what? The emphasis now is how are you living your life now? Now watch this now. We have no problem assigning the crucifixion of Christ for 2,000 years ago. We have no problem thinking about what's going to happen in heaven. But when it comes to today, we have a hard time living and glorifying Christ today. Amen? And so we come to this, well, back to the first one, please. Um, he says, you know what, I want you all to understand really what's transpiring when it comes to justification by faith. Y'all all right? And so, Christ, you know what? I want you to die. To live. In, in, in other words, if you're going to live the life that Christ wants you to live, you've got to die to the flesh. This first word he has here, um, he says, I have been crucified. This word here, um, I have been crucified together, crucified together with Christ. And so this whole thing of being crucified together with Christ is a concept we have to understand. And so the problem is we don't really understand what it means to be crucified with Christ. See, what we think is, you know what, you know what, I'm a believer. I put everything to death, the burial, the resurrection. I got to get my stuff together. I got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I've got to put extra effort into it. But we really don't understand that it really is justification by faith, and it's not justification by works. Well, Pastor, what does it mean to be justified? To be justified means that, boy, God declares you righteous. See, justification is not just as if you've never sinned. Justification is, is that God makes a declaration that in spite of your efforts, your work, and your failures, in light of Christ's work and Christ's efforts and what Christ has done, God chooses to declare you righteous. He doesn't make you righteous because if he makes you righteous, that means you never sin again. He declares you righteous in spite of your actions, in spite of your behaviors, in spite of your um, 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 dropping the ball. He declares you righteous. Are we tracking together? 
So in other words, then, when you really understand this, you don't wonder if you've lost your salvation when you sin because, because your salvation was never based upon your efforts in the first place. So my question becomes, if you didn't get saved by your works, how can you lose your salvation by your works? And so what happens is we're not secure in Christ. So I want to break down some of these words in this passage to help us better understand this. Amen? Amen. The first term, um, I'm sorry, uh, when you come to this term, um, I've been crucified together with Christ. Um, this word's an interesting word because in the Greek, it's not just simple past tense. There are a variety of past tenses. Y'all right? And so I never learned English grammar until I took Greek. Smile at me. And so recently, I was, uh, recently, um, just last week, I was writing a letter over to Cook Children's Hospital to thank them for how they took care of my daughter Taylor back in 2016 when she was sick. Amen? And so I've called them and told them thank you. I, um, I talk about them every but I never sent a formal letter saying thank you. So I said, on Monday, I'm going to put this together. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put together a letter today. I'm going to type it out. So I typed out this long letter and I put it into Grammarly to make sure it was grammatically correct. Smile at me. And so I had everything almost correct, but then it kept telling me that I had passive sentences. And so I, so I go in there and change it. It was still passive. And so it dawned on me, I didn't understand what a passive sentence was. So I asked my wife. I said, honey, it keeps telling me that it's a passive. She said, yeah, honey, passive means that the, that the subject is receiving the action rather than the subject doing it. So bingo, I got it. All right. Sometimes it's important to understand grammar. Amen. Here what's happening, this is a, the word crucified, um, um, it's P-N-T-V-M, um, 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 person, number, tense, voice, and move, um, 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 mood in the Greek. And so, boy, I'm turning that paper where it says crucified. Um, um, the word crucified is first person. And so Paul is communicating this, not as he's speaking on behalf of a group, he's speaking for himself. He says, he says, he says, I, first person, I, are we tracking together? Um, 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 second person is um, we or they. I'm sorry, I mean, third person is they. I, we, or they. Right? So watch it now. So Paul says it's first person and then it's singular, but then it's perfect tense. So perfect tense in the Greek says, it says, boy, it's a completed action in the past with continued effects in the present. Are we tracking together? Now watch this now. We've got no problem saying Christ died for us 2,000 years ago. We've got no problem. You know what? I'm going to be in heaven with Christ one day. But, 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 but boy, the power of the crucifixion, when you identify with Christ, is that boy, it's got continuing effects in the present. In other words, are you benefiting from, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you engaging the present benefits of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Y'all good? It's first person, it's singular, it's perfect, and then it's passive. So what's passive? Passive means that, boy, you are receiving the action, and you're not the one who's doing the action. Now, that's tough for us in America, because in America, we're all about making it happen. In America, we're all about doing it ourselves. Paul is saying, you know what? When it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you are the one who are the recipient of the actions. You are the beneficiary of the actions. It's not what you are doing for yourself. And so Christianity, the Christianity does not say do, Christianity says done. Are we tracking together? I wonder how it would respond in Christianity if we really operate it based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Instead of trying to finish his work, what if we function based upon the finished work of Christ in salvation and what he has done for us? And so what happens is many of us are not drawing our identity from what Christ has already done. Our identity is based upon these external factors, our job, our house, our car, and guys, all that's fine, but when it comes to salvation, that cannot be your identity. Your identity has to be caught up in what Christ has already done for you. And so what Paul says, if there's anybody else who can boast in the flesh, it's me. But he said, I consider all those things scuba eye. He says, you know they're, they're like human excrement in the comparison of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. When it comes to your Christian life, do you take confidence in the flesh or do you take confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ? So when it comes to shaping identity, where do you, where do you align yourself? You good? 
So the first thing we see here is a is a um, personification or a personalization. Paul says, I, 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 I have been crucified. And what Paul is saying, you know what? I, I have placed my faith, I have placed my identity in the death, the burial, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So now what you have is you have people who want to argue for, 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 for communal salvation, group salvation, race salvation. And what God says, you know what, when it comes to salvation, salvation is an individual commitment. And so, boy, you, there, there are no second generation Christians. Every Christian is first generation. You have to believe for yourself personally. So Paul says, you know what? I have been crucified with Christ. Now, if you're reading carefully, you ought to say, okay, well, okay. How in the world can I be crucified with Christ? Because you know what? I mean, sometimes I feel old, my bones act old. Sometimes I even look old. But I don't look 2,000 years old, do I? So he said, I've been crucified with Christ. Most of us just skip that. Don't we? Let me just keep on reading to find some understanding. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? How could I participate in Christ's death when it was over 2,000 years ago? What Paul is saying is that as a believer in Christ, you participated vicariously in his crucifixion. In other words, it was just as if you were there. So what he does is he, 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 he imputes, he charges to your accounts, he, he, he credits you as if you were right there on Calvary's cross. So that when Christ was there, boy, he's being marched from judgment hall to judgment hall. He was being beat, he was being whipped, and boy, he was paying the price for all sins. God counted that to your account. Are we tracking together? Now watch this now. He said that, boy, you vicariously participated, and so he gave you credit for being there. And so you say, well, you say, well wait a minute, do I really identify that? Does that resonate with me? Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. You know what? Everything that Christ benefited, everything that Christ gained when he was being crucified, God has now charged to my account. The reason that when you die, you get to go to heaven, because on Calvary's cross, when Christ was crucified, paying the price for sins, you didn't pay the price for your own sins. Christ paid for your sins. But watch this now, because you believe in Christ, God credits to your account what Christ achieved. Are we tracking together? And so most of us don't live with that as our identifying mark on who we are. And so because you are in Christ, because you know Christ, because you identify with Christ, because of, of your relationship with him, you get a chance to experience victory. Amen? So we talk about having administrators let's go back to school and teachers go back to school and, and now you're there and boy, you're administering and you're teaching and you're serving and things get tough and things get rough. How do you identify yourself? Well, you know what? I got good education. There's plenty of folks with good education, but it hadn't resolved the problems of our society. We're tracking together. So number one is personalization. Number two is representation and unification. He says here, he says here in verse 20 on page 973, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, watch this now. He's saying, boy, whom do you identify with? Is Christ your representative or are you representing yourself? So I grew up um, in the Midwest, up in Detroit, and um, up there they had these things called labor unions. Anybody here from the Midwest? You might know what a union is? Smile at me. And so like, you know, typically in the South, you're, 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 you're in right to work states. That means, you know what? Whenever you want to leave, you can leave. Whenever we want to fire you, we can fire you as long as we follow the, the rules in our organization, right? But in a union, that's not so. So like, for example, like with Chrysler and Ford, and automotive company, they have unions. They have labor unions. So in a labor union, what happens is, is that when the employees go to an organization, there's a group who negotiates with Chrysler or the organization. So you know what? We want to ascertain these benefits for our employees. We negotiate hours. We negotiate job descriptions. We negotiate retirement. We negotiate pay. 
negotiate, we, um, um, boy, we negotiate conditions, we negotiate the stand by which you can find, just can't go in there and just fire somebody, you gotta talk to the union. And so what happens is when somebody takes an action against an individual, it's not acting primarily against the individual, it's acting against the entire agreement that was made for the entire union. Now we're tracking together. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you now have union with Christ. And so if Christ is your representative, you now are, are, are the shared beneficiary of all the benefits, all the promises, all the glory, all the honor that God has negotiated for you. Amen? And so the question becomes, as you live your life as a Christian, are you drawing upon your union in Christ because Christ is your representative? See, boy, um, turn to Romans 5. Turn to Romans 5, please. Romans 5. Y'all good? Romans 5. Romans 5, um, page 942, start at verse 12. So, guys, here's the principle. Guys, the principle is um, 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 you only have two options when it comes to representatives. Either you are representative, representative, represent, you, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo. Either you are represented by Adam or you are represented by Christ. You say, well, Pastor, I represent myself. By default, that means you're being represented by Adam. So, um, you know, um, I was watching CNN the other day, and um, I just happened to see um, Mark Vesey on CNN. So, you know what? I'm excited for Mark Vesey because Mark um, Vesey is a Fort Worthian, and, boy, he represents some people who are past, et cetera, et cetera. I was excited to see Mark Vesey because he, he's one of our representatives. Guys, who's representing you spiritually before God? Either it's Satan, it's the first Adam, or it's Jesus Christ. And boy, Satan falls up under the whole category of the old Adam. So it's really just two categories. It's either you remember about the old Adam or about Jesus Christ. Romans 5, starting verse 12. You guys good? He says in verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that was Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So watch in verse 12, he said, you know what? You cannot pick and choose who your representative is as it relates to the, um, to the incorporation of sin into humanity. You're part of humanity. One man introduced sin, and that spread to all. So since Adam was your representative in humanity, when he represents you, everything he represents and the consequences for him are the consequences for you. You're still good. And death um, through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. So the law was introduced so mankind would recognize what it meant to miss God's mark. The law never satisfied God. There was no one ever able to live the law so completely and comprehensively that they satisfied God. In other words, how many of you all set rules you don't even keep? Okay? All right, let's keep going. Verse 14. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So, um, so in the Old Testament, what you have is you have a bunch of types in the Old Testament. And so what it is, boy, it gives you an early example of what Christ is going to be like later. It gives you an inferior template. So, boy, when the next one comes, you can recognize it. So Adam was a type of Christ. He wasn't Christ. He was a type of Christ in that he represented a people group. When Christ came, he became the perfect representative. Are we good? Y'all good? Now what happens is many of us are trying to work our way to happiness, work our way to sufficiency, work our way to adequacy, rather than saying, all I got to do is choose the right representative. So it goes on here. What are we at? Verse 15? But the free gift is not like the trespass. Um, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So he may split up, you know what? If you have the right representative, what he does is his benefits abound for the many. 
and the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses, um, trespasses brought justification. So what's he saying? He's saying, boy, when you followed Adam, ended up in condemnation. But when you follow Christ, it ends up in justification. Y'all good? He goes on to say this, verse 17. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So what he's doing is, boy, he's giving you parallel between Christ and Adam. Christ and Adam. Christ is condemnation. God is justification. Adam, I'm sorry. Adam is condemnation. Christ is justification. Um, Adam was the entry of sin. God was the resolution. Christ was the resolution of sin. Verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the uh, many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, um, ab um, grace abounded all the more. Y'all right? So watch this now. How often do we think we lose our salvation when we sin? You know what, I sinned, I dropped the ball, I've messed up, I can't go to heaven because, boy, I committed the sin. You were never going to heaven because you, because you kept the ball in the air. You were never going to heaven because you got it everywhere. You were going to heaven because of what Christ has done. See, boy, you were going to heaven because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So, 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 so people commit, Christians commit suicide sometimes. Watch this now. Christians commit suicide sometimes because they feel hopeless. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So if sin is at a seven, grace at an eight. If sin's at 10, grace at 11. If sin on 900, grace at 1,000. Wherever sin goes, grace super abounds beyond sin. But what happens is many of us are trying to live our life based upon our performance. And God says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So it's this whole idea, it's, it's, it's this whole idea of, of representation and unified. Who are you unified with? Who are you identified with? Who are, who's representing you? Y'all good? Back at, on page 973, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You know the problem with many of us as Christians? We're still living. What do you mean still living? Well, 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 Pastor, we're all breathing. What do you mean by still living? What Paul is saying is Paul was still breathing as well with these words. What Paul is saying is, you know what? No longer am I dependent upon myself to live an effective life. I'm now dependent upon Christ to live through me. But the problem is we're not destroying, mortifying, and killing the flesh enough. Are we together? I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, no longer I who live. In other words, you know what? When I live my life, it's no longer my impulses, my ideas, my ingenuity, my wisdom. My now you know what? It is Christ now living through me. That's why some of y'all still cussing people out. It's the flesh. The devil made me do it. <laughs> Pastor, if they wouldn't have said nothing, I wouldn't have said nothing. <laughs> Mama always told me, somebody hit you, hit them back, all righty. Don't start none, won't be none. Static! No static. Uh, anyway, <laughs> smile at me, all righty. Y'all silly. All right, so watch this now. You've got to mortify the flesh. You know, watch this now. When you come to Christ and Christ crucifies the flesh, it does not mean the flesh is no longer alive. It means the flesh no longer has the final word in your life. But the problem is, for many of us, we still are allowing the old flesh to have the final word in our marriage, in our parenting, in our thought life, in our activity. The flesh is still reigning in our lives. 
And the Christ life is not living through us. Are we tracking together? So I text this basketball coach the other day. I'm trying to get one of my kids on his team. And um, I was at dinner with my wife on last um, Sunday after, after we left church. And so I texted him and he replied back, you should have made, he said, well, you should have made the deadline and you missed the deadline. I have to catch you next time. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take in. Count to 99, 99. My wife said, what did he say? I said, honey, he checked off on me. He checked off on me. So I went back to check the flyer just to make sure I had it wrong. So I kept, I'm good at documentation. I went back and checked the flyer, and guess what? I still had two days. In Jesus' name. So you know what I did, right? I didn't get smart. I said, I apologize. I took, a, I took a picture of it, then I, I circled it in red on the page, and then, and then boy, um, <laughs> I attached it and sent it back to her. I said, no, I apologize. I must have misread the date on the page. Now, see, my flesh wanted me to respond back curtly. My flesh wanted to tell him where to meet me in the next 30 minutes, right? I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know what? You know what? I'm not going to respond in the flesh. Now, to be honest, couple days ago, I would have responded in the flesh. But I'm more mature now, right? <laughs> so I want to respond by the Spirit. How do you respond when the flesh rears its ugly head? Turn back to Romans 6. Y'all good? Yeah. Romans 6, powerful passage here. Start at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now watch this now. He says in verse um, 18, 19, he says, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So to a carnal person, they'll say, you know what? Grace is always going to cover me so I can keep on sinning. Yeah. But then he, he addresses that because he knows who he's talking to. Yeah. So Romans 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Y'all still with me? He says, watch this now. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now the challenge, the challenge is, is that boy, there has not been a clean break for many of us from our old life to our current life. There hadn't been distinction between our life before Christ and now our life in Christ. See, boy, when you come to Christ, your works don't get you saved. But when Christ saves you, you ought to work like you're saved. Watch this now. You cannot merit salvation, but once God does save you, you ought to now live a life that's congruent with him. So see, boy, the frustration in the Christian life comes here is that, boy, there's some internal realities and benefits that God's worked into our lives. But then our external lives are inconsistent with those internal realities. And so now there's incongruency and there's a battle between what's happening on the outside and what's happening on the inside. And now there is, um, there is emotional turmoil and insecurity and a void because we're not living out what Christ has worked in. Are we tracking together? And so now that's what those... What those inconsistent feeling. He says, you know what? When you continue to sin, when you continue to smoke dope, when you continue to drink too much, you continue to lie, you continue to cuss, you continue to steal, whatever you continue, whatever you continue doing, whenever that steal your life, the problem is you are not appropriating and applying the power of Jesus Christ to your situation. We live in a world where, well, you know, I'm working on it, and boy, I'm processing. I mean, oh boy, I'm, I'm trying to get to it. But I, you've been there 15 years. How long did you get there? At what point? Did you, you say, well, I have been crucified with Christ. And because I have been crucified in Christ, and boy, this flesh is real, but so is the power of God. I ain't got to grab that bottle. I ain't got to make that phone call. I don't have to continue in adultery or promiscuity. I ain't got to keep on stealing because my identity is in Christ. Are we tracking together? He says, guys, when you continue in sin as a believer in Jesus Christ, it is inconsistent with your new creation in Christ. It's not just bad. It's inconsistent with your new nature in Jesus Christ. So I'm like, boy, you now, when you go sin as a believer, you are living an abnormal life. See, boy, the normal life of the Christian is not sin. That's the abnormal life of the Christian is to live in sin. 
I was talking together. I wonder what would happen if we took this seriously. Talking about, you know what, um, irreconcilable differences in marriage. If both of you all are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and both of you all are killing the flesh, it's going to transform the household. When it comes to parenting, if a child just starts submitting to Christ, come on, you know, the parent's always right. So if the child just starts, uh, that's a joke. That's a joke. The parents are always right, smiling, right? So watch that. If, if the child starts submitting to Christ and start living for Christ and start mortifying the flesh and stop continuing in sin, guys, obedience to God is not legalism. Before you being legalistic. No, legalism is not obedience. Legalism is depending upon the law to save you. Legalism is measuring your Christianity and comparing yourself to somebody else so you think that you're better. And that's legalism. But being obedient is not legalism. Let's keep on reading. Y'all good? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Then he comes with the strongest negation in the Bible. Um, Ume meganointa. He says, by no means. Normally you will see one word negation in the original text. But you very rarely see these ume and meganoita all put together. And so here he, he, he has the strongest negation in the entire Bible. In fact, my degree was in New Testament Greek. Y'all good? And so but when, but we were coming through here and our professor was teaching us what was in this passage. Um, the, guy who taught, um, the guy who taught the world-renowned Dan Wallace, he said, well, when you come here, if you really want to get the force of by no means, because people are by no means, y'all think about Malcolm X. By, no, by, by any means necessary, right? No, 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 no somebody said, man. Right? Yeah, but by the way, the, the full force of this is that when you come in, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hell no. <laughs> That's what my Greek professor said. I wouldn't use those words. That's what my Greek prof said, all right? If you want the full force of this, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. It's ludicrous to continue in sin based upon your new nature in Christ. Yeah. Now, before I read this passage years ago, I had a real bad temper. And sometimes my temper still flare up. My flesh still real, right? On the basketball court. I remember one time this guy was coming through the lane, and for the first time he came through, he bumped me. <laughs> the next time he came through, I put an elbow on his eye. Bam! I ran down court like ain't nothing happened. <laughs> just, just mean. Just mean. Somebody do something bad to him, you know what? You struck first blood, I'm going to even the score. That was wrong, and you started it, you started it, I'm going to finish it. You made me mad? If you wouldn't make me mad, I wouldn't have went off on you. And then I read this passage. He says here in verse, in verse um, chapter 6, starting at verse 5. For if we have, you know what, I don't want to skip, this, this is too good, I don't want to skip verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, notice the word order Christ Jesus, it's talking about the deity of Christ, were baptized into his death? Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Are you walking in newness of life or oldness of life? Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know, that, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You guys see it? For, for, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Watch this now. Y'all still with me? Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Guys, who are you living your life to? Righteousness solves a whole bunch of problems. Now, there still be some but guys, it solves a whole bunch of problems. Verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So guys, when you're going through life, are you going to yourself alive to God or are you dead to God? See, either you're alive to God and dead to sin, or you're alive to sin and dead to God. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. 
How many of y'all know about sin? Sin becomes a desire. Sin becomes a passion. Now watch this now. Many of us, we have a problem with people who are addicted to, to, to illegal and um, illicit drugs. But what's interesting to me, we've got addictions in our lives. That is not illegal. Are we tracking together? Some of y'all can't make it through a day without getting a cup of coffee. That's an addiction. Some of y'all can't make it through a day without smoking cigarettes. That's an addiction. Some of y'all can't make it through a day without screaming at your spouse. <laughs> That's an addiction. All right. <laughs> but it goes on and on. Things that you cannot stop doing and you do on a regular basis becomes, but it's, it's, it's an addiction. May not be illegal, but it's an addiction nonetheless. Amen? He says here in verse 12, he says, he says, he says, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. See, guys, the issue is not if sin is resident. The question becomes, is sin president? Sin's going to be with you until you go home to glory. He says here, to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Are you an instrument of righteousness or an instrument of unrighteousness? For sin shall have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. How many of you have heard the theology of Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. Let me tell you something. That's a lie from the pit of hell. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as one who's been crucified with Christ, and now Christ is living on the inside of you and Christ is living through you, and that, and, that, and that, boy, because Christ was victorious over sin and sin has no dominion over him and you are now in Christ, sin has no dominion over you and you are a child of grace, the devil cannot make you do anything. Let me tell you a secret. Tell you a secret. Y'all good? And I was losing my cool and losing my temper. It's because it made me feel better. Because it pacified my flesh. Because I wanted to do it. Even now, whenever we sin, it's because we choose to sin. Not because we have to sin. The Bible says that sin no longer has dominion over you. You don't have to do it. The question becomes, will you allow Christ's life to live through you? Or you live based upon that flesh? The next time somebody disrespects you, gets smart with you, offends you, it's okay for the fresh to rise up, but you push it right back down with the grace of God. Next time you're made offend you, instead of saying, you've offended me for the last time, allow Christ to live in you. You know what? Christ has endured far more than what I'm enduring. Well, maybe. Christ has endured, <laughs> smile at me, far more than what I'm enduring right now. And because Christ can endure it, and I'm in Christ, I can endure whatever you say, however you say it to me, and I can endure it. On your job, well, they, they're mistreating me. They, they're not doing me right. I'm not going to go in on time. I'm not, not going to work hard. So you know what? Um, um, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and the shame. You know, Christ is now living through me. So now I'm not going to give you a piece of my mind. I'm going to give you a piece of the Christ that's in me. Amen. Long I who lives but Christ who lives in me. I got a whole lot more. I can't get to it today. <laughs> but we'll get to it next week. Amen. Amen. We cannot experience, I'm sorry, we can't express Christ fully until we experience him faithfully. How are you experiencing Christ on a daily basis? Are you dying to live are you relying upon him? Are you dependent upon him? Are you crucifying the flesh by the power of God based upon your identity in Christ? Or are you trying to pull it off in your own power, your own strength?